Hey guys, what's going on? Today I got my top 10 all-time favorite sci-fi books for you. Starting with number 10, a book that I thought was an undiscovered gem back when I read it. I was working at the library, I had first dibs on book donations, and the cover of this one really pulled me in. Which is funny because I see a lot of people hating on this cover. The book is Hyperion by Dan Simmons. It's about a group of intergalactic pilgrims who are going to the planet Hyperion to see the Shrike, which is this spiky metal deity you'll see there, and you'll probably see a couple cool renditions of them over there. It's a fix-up novel told in six parts, I believe, each one being one of the Traveler's backstory. They all have their unique reasons for making the pilgrimage. The first story, the priest story, is my favorite. It's ominous, it's gruesome, it's enticing. And then you got the soldier's story, which is like a Starship Troopers thing. And then you got the poet story, which is more lofty. Dan Simmons clearly knew what science fiction fans were, so he has one story aimed at each one for the philosophical sci-fi people, for the military sci-fi people, for the horror sci-fi people. And in between all of these stories, you get these small glimpses into the world of Hyperion as they travel through it over the water on these giant turtles and the mountains and the lakes and the fields and the crowded cities, which everyone is trying to get out of because of the impending AI invasion. One thing I do have to say is that the first chapter was very heavy. You get hit with a lot of names, you get hit with a lot of terms. It's really demanding of you, but Get past that first chapter and then it's smooth sailing, I assure you. And next up we got number nine, which is definitely an outlier on this list. You know, I read Starship Troopers a while ago and I liked it. I've always been good at separating the art from the artists, but I wish someone had told me that there was a strictly better Starship Troopers out there. That there was a Starship Troopers written more for my generation, and that's John Scalzi's Old Man's War. In the future, war is fought by old people because they can have their consciousness lifted into this green, genetically engineered super soldier, kind of like an Avatar deal. It's very much like Starship Troopers. Our main character is a natural, he rises up in the ranks, he earns accolades, and then he finds himself kind of at the head of the military when the alien invasion happens, which is when it really gets good. And I remember something I read about Scalzi, how he comes up with his alien names, is he takes like a normal word, like the example was Sprite, and you cut off the first letter and the last letter, and then you get Prit, which is like a beautiful alien name. So you could do it for anything, I guess, like book, that doesn't work. Um, shelf, hell, that doesn't work either. Well, I'm sure it works on a lot of things. John Scalzi has a very easygoing, kind of matter-of-fact writing style that always makes for a quick and enjoyable read. That's not always something I'm looking for. If you've watched my other videos, you can probably tell my taste is more philosophical sci-fi. But every now and then, I just want to be mindlessly entertained, and this book did that incredibly well. If you like military sci-fi, you've probably already heard of it, but check it out. And unfortunately, I can't recommend the sequels. I've read two of them, and they just don't have the same charm to them. I don't know the word, but it just wasn't the same, unfortunately. Number eight which is not so much a specific book, but more the author in general, which is kind of cheating, I guess. But if you've watched my channel at all, you'll know I love Kurt Vonnegut, and I chose Cat's Cradle here because it's one of his more definitively sci-fi books. Not that the synopsis of a Vonnegut book means anything, but it's about one of the inventors of the atomic bomb, someone trying to write a book about him, and he had also invented something called Ice-9 for the military, which was a biological weapon that could turn all water in the world into ice, which would obviously cause some problems. You know, I love Vonnegut. I think in my last video I called him a saint or something, but apparently that hasn't always been the case. I was going through my archives to get all my thoughts on these books, and I found where I had first read Slaughterhouse-Five, and I had some interesting things to say about it. Let me read. For me, it was too much to follow all of the random oddities, let alone keep track of how it all worked together. It seemed to contradict itself at every turn. Okay, I get it. War is bad, and our lives are set in stone. So then what's the point in writing this book if nothing can change that? I can see my point. It makes me wonder, at the risk of sounding pretentious, how much young kids can get out of Vonnegut. I know he's taught in high school, and obviously they get the anti-war sentiments and just how absurd war is. But it's not just war that's absurd, but it's everything that's absurd. It's life that's absurd. And I imagine a lot of kids, apparently myself included, 
get confused and kind of turned off to Vonnegut, yes, it does expose them to Vonnegut, but if it's not fully clicking, then they could have this lifelong, like, oh yeah, Vonnegut, Slaughterhouse-Five, yeah, that was kind of weird, I didn't, didn't really get it. But he obviously helped me, I'm glad I picked him up again, even though I might have not responded to Slaughterhouse-Five very well in the first place, which is surprising. We see the world through the same lens, he's given me the shield that I needed to protect myself in this irrational world. Super important to me. You always get something worthwhile out of it, and it's entertaining as well, which is incredible. Oh, and my favorite short story of all time, I might say that three times in this video, my favorite short story of all time, but I think for real my favorite short story of all time, Harrison Bergeron by Kurt Vonnegut. If you haven't read it, check it out. So relevant to today. Beautiful stuff. Number seven. Whoa, spoilers. Uh, a short story collection. Some of the smartest sci-fi here on the list. It is, as you just saw, Stories of Your Life and Others by Ted Chang. I've talked about this before. The reason it's on the list here is because every story in it is good. Generally, it's a mixed bag with short story collections. Generally, in the middle, there's all these filler stories. They're so obviously filler stories, but not this time. He's got a story about a math equation that is so irrational that it causes people to commit suicide. He's got an absurd take on social justice, and he's got a story told from the perspective of a parrot, asking humans why they're so obsessed with finding aliens, with finding someone else to talk to in the universe, when, you know, he's right here. I'm a parrot, I can talk. What am I, chopped liver? But the most moving story of all is the title piece, Stories of Your Life, which is just so masterfully constructed, and it comes together at the end so beautifully and so perfectly that as, as an aspiring writer, it was almost discouraging to read that story because it's just the level of perfection and cohesion, I don't think I could ever match. But for that, it deserves a lot of credit. He gets a little too technical at times, and it gets in the way of the storytelling, but I guess that's the price you pay for smart science fiction like this. Read this one. Read Exhalation as well, his other collection of short stories, which was very good, but not quite as good. And nothing in it quite reached the height of stories of your life, but still all good stories in their own right. Number six. This book marks a very scary time in my life. Without oversharing, I was going to the hospital for a procedure, and I had brought this book for some much-needed distraction, and the procedure, for whatever reason, left my vision blurred. So I remember sitting in the hospital bed, desperately trying to read this book, and reading the same line over and over. It was the scene that was trying to vilify someone like they did in Lord of the Rings with King Denethor, when he's chowing down on those grape tomatoes and just, like, splashing it everywhere. I tried to read that probably a hundred times, but I couldn't do it. You'd think I'd want to forget about it, but here it is on my list. It is A Canticle for Leibowitz by Walter M. Miller Jr. It's about a far future Earth post-nuclear holocaust, or what they call the flame deluge. It's got a religious connotation. Obviously, people are clustered in these monastery-type situations. One of the main characters, Brother Francis, is out there in the wastes. I think he's trying to hide from wolves or something demonizing wolves. As always, literature, he stumbles upon a old fallout shelter owned by some dude named Leibowitz, and inside are all these technical documents, just a wealth of information that he brings back to the cloister or the monastery. But the documents go against the current religious doctrine, so they try to suppress them, but they can't quite, and they get out, and it's like a golden age. Then the book leaps far forward in the future, and then far forward in the future again, where humans are once again at the precipice of this nuclear holocaust, and thematic spoilers, the book is very cynical, which I think is why I connected with it at the time. It is a barn burner. It takes a long time to get going. I don't think I was really hooked until, like, the second act, which is, like, halfway through the book, but that's why I connected with it. I connected with it because it was cynical, because it had this very negative outlook on people, and at the time, the world was kicking my ass, and it felt good. It feels good to, like, sit in your own sorrow and anger sometimes, and that's not healthy. I know it's not healthy, but at the time, it's what I did. It was very cathartic to read the cynical viewpoint of the world and people, and, you know, I'm not that way anymore as much. Was it for the best that I read it at that time? I like to think so. 
But in any case, it is like a snapshot on my bookshelf of that point in my life, which I don't like to think about, but it was part of me. It's what made me me, so it's on my list. Number five, the longest book on the list and probably the hardest sci-fi on the list. A lot of people's favorites, Children of Time by Adrian Tchaikovsky. It's about a terraforming project. Earth has been trashed, so they're trying to seed this new planet with life. I think it's monkeys that they're trying to do it with, and they invent this virus that's supposed to speed up the evolutionary process. But the monkeys get sabotaged, and instead the virus gets injected into spiders. The book then goes over the span of centuries, millennia probably, about how these spiders evolve socially and technologically, how they gain power over their predators, and eventually how they create airships and reach up to the humans who are in these orbiting space stations, who are essentially the spider's gods, and they kind of coexist with the humans. And together, they deal with some overarching threats. It's really smart stuff. It's so many clever ideas. It does earn its page count, which is a hard one for me. And it's also got this little colony ship subplot to it. I had like a colony ship fetish a little while ago and I read just everything I could find with colony ships in it. If you don't know, that's like when a ship is supposed to go a very long distance and instead of like cryogenic freezing, they just reproduce in the ship as it's going on. So maybe like four generations, five generations, 50 generations later, they will arrive at their planet and be able to, hopefully with a big enough gene pool, be able to live on the planet. And, and, th and that colony ship subplot has everything you'd want from it. It's got tribalism, it's got weird techno mysticism. It's good stuff. But to achieve all this, the book completely sacrifices character development, which for me is not that big of a deal. I'm sure other people can only read character-driven stories. This is not that. But I feel like it makes up for it in excess with all of the things that it does well. And once again, I have to say the sequel is not quite as good. I read Children of Ruin, which is the same premise of a terraforming project gone wrong. And he takes a familiar species and he evolves it in a lot of interesting ways, a lot of cool ways. But it just didn't have the same charm to it. I don't know. I don't feel like the second one earned the page count. First one definitely did. Check it out if you haven't. Number four. I've talked about this one before. It was the book that got me into science fiction definitively, I think. Probably true for a lot of other people. I claimed millions of other people. I don't know. Ender's Game by Orson Scott Card. It's the story of a young boy who essentially goes into military boarding school. He is genetically engineered to be a military genius, as are all the other kids in the boarding school. They need to train and reach their full potential because there is an impending alien invasion, and we're going to need our best strategists for that. There's a bunch of characters. They're all well drawn. Ender specifically, I really connected with. In my other video, I had it for beginner readers, for people who are trying to get back into reading because it's just so engrossing. It's so effortlessly engrossing. And as a bonus, the sequels are actually good. Speaker of the Dead is incredible. Uh, maybe better than Ender's Game. Some people would say so. A lot of people would say so. But it definitely requires more focus and it's a little more in-depth science fiction novel as opposed to Ender's Game, which is very much YA, but I don't think they had that as a classification back then. If you're looking to get into science fiction or reading in general, this is the one for you. Check it out. Number three. This is the other author pick here on the list. He is a cornerstone of classic science fiction. If you've watched my other videos, you probably know who it is. Philip K. Dick. And I chose A Scanner Darkly because it is my favorite Philip K. Dick story. It's about a group of junkies who are addicted to substance D. D for death. It's got an incredible opening line, and per usual, it's got a bunch of unreliable narrators. You don't know if what they're saying is true or false. You don't know if what they're experiencing is true or false. And the main character is also an undercover agent for the whatever the DEA is in this world. And while he's working as an agent, he has this skin suit, I forget what they call it, but it makes it so that you're constantly shifting shape between different human forms. You know, like you could be an Asian woman and then you're a black man and then you're a, a white woman. So that no one could ever fully describe what you look like. And he, as an agent, is tasked with surveilling himself as a civilian because no one knows who he actually is. 
And if that sounds confusing, it probably should. That's what I tell you, that's, that's Philip K. Dick. And that's why I feel I can choose him as an author in general, because all of his books have the same kind of formatting, the same kind of feel. Like, you know when you're reading a Philip K. Dick book. It's got the forehead wrinkling, it's got the confusion, it's got the questions of reality, you're wondering what's true, what's not. And that has really seeped into my own life, for better or for worse. I mean, I feel it's a really good skill to have to look beyond the words sometimes, to look beyond the reality sometimes. I mean, ignorance is bliss, and if I wasn't aware of all of this other stuff, maybe my life would be happier. So perhaps it is the curse of Dick, or the gift of Dick. I guess that's up to the reader. Number two, a book I read at the very tail end of college. I was entirely checked out at the time, which was unfortunate because I still needed three credits to graduate, but my guidance counselor let me do this one-on-one -on -one summer session with one of the writing instructors. I majored in creative writing. And luckily, he prescribed this book, The Masterpieces of Science Fiction, which has so many incredible Golden Age stories and modern stories. It's got Call Me Joe by Paul Anderson, which is this Avatar-type scenario where a handicapped guy uses this big Yeti-like creature to colonize Venus, I think it is, maybe Jupiter? It's got The Men Return by Jack Vance, which is this bizarre, totally bizarre story that is somehow charming and enticing. All You Zombies, the classic Heinlein time travel story. Toonsmith by Lloyd Biggle Jr. The only thing I've read by Lloyd Biggle Jr., and I want to say it one more time, Lloyd Biggle Jr., which is a story that was clearly written in the world of the jingle. And I kind of miss the jingle. I know it was just like, you know, propaganda. I'm going to implant this little tune in your head so that you remember the name of my product. But at least they gave you a little jingle, right? Now it's just flashing lights and like loud voices that do that, but... I don't know, something nostalgic about the jingle. A Saucer of Loneliness by Sturgeon, which is a genius story and a touching story that comes together perfectly at the end. Robot Dreams by Asima, which of course is a classic, but not his best. This book actually doesn't have Nightfall in it. I read that later. Definitely my favorite Asima short story. The Nine Billion Names of God by Arthur C. Clarke, which is another classic foundational sci-fi short story. I remember I read that. I was in the car waiting for a Magic the Gathering tournament to begin. Repent Harlequin, said the TikTok man, by Harlan Ellison. And I have to admit, it's the only thing I've read by Ellison that I actually like. It's this neat story about a future where if you're late, they take the amount of time you're late off of your life. And I always thought that was funny because I know a lot of people that would not succeed in that society. It's got Silverberg, it's got Lafferty, it's got Niven, it's got Aldous. It's got all these huge names, and this is where I saw them all for the first time. It's also got new stuff, Sand Kings by George R. R. Martin, which is a really good short story, one of my favorites. Oh, and Bears Discovered Fire by Terry Bisson is, again, I'm gonna say, one of my favorite short stories of all time. It's just so absurd, and like, for no reason. You're trying to read into it, but you realize it's just absurd, and I don't know. Sometimes you don't really need a reason to really like a story. Bears Discover Fire just tickled me. It just tickled me. It's chock full of great stuff, but the best part was the instructor, who unfortunately I never had as a teacher, but he just had such a passion for the science fiction and this old science fiction, and obviously that passed down to me, which is why I'm here making this video right now. So I feel like this book had such an impact on me that it had to be near the top of the list. Number one, a book that had the biggest effect on me out of any book I've ever read, period, even outside of science fiction. If you've watched my channel, I wonder if I've given enough hints for you to know what this book is. It's philosophical science fiction. Some would describe it as navel-gazing. I've heard it described as navel-gazing before, and I don't argue that. It is definitely very fanciful language, which is generally not my thing, but for whatever reason, she really nailed it here. The Left Hand of Darkness by Ursula K. Le Guin. I've talked about it before. I think I've said it's my favorite book. It's about an envoy that's sent to a newly discovered world called Winter. It's an ice scape world. And the envoy is there to see if the people are ready to be accepted into the greater galactic community. The book follows the envoy as he kind of maps out the world. It is split into two factions, much like The Dispossessed, where Le Guin kind of puts these contrasting worlds right next to each other. The first one is ruled by the Mad King, 
who is very concerned by something called Shifgrathor, and I'm sure I'm saying that wrong, but it's kind of this shadow prestige battle that's played in between words of a conversation. And I remember reading that for the first time and just being like struck by knowledge. Like for the first time, I had the language to convey just this vague idea that I had before. Because that kind of stuff happens all the time when you're talking to people and they're trying to one-up you, especially in like a business setting or some kind of competitive aspect, even like a, like a sport or a hobby. And the other faction is only happy to see the envoy because the envoy choosing that faction is just a win in the Shifgrathor battle. So yet again, it's a book talking about tribalism. It's a book talking about these labels and these barriers that we put in between ourselves and other humans. Obviously the envoy is there to take the race as a whole into the galactic community, but they're too busy, they're too tied up in conflicting with the other nation. This completely arbitrary line that they've drawn between themselves. But most people are going to remember this book for the fact that the aliens don't have gender. Or, not that they don't have gender, but that they choose their gender. Like frogs, I think, do this, where if they find a mate and the mate is female, then they will become male to, to create the whole. Which is another, another theme of this book, is two sides creating a whole. Which, in an ideal world, is what gender is. And it's really hard to look at this book in terms of gender because it was written in 1969 and you better believe the gender relations landscape was a completely different place back then. So you can't look at it too heavily in that aspect. Le Guin did get a lot of flack for this book because she refers to the creatures as he by default. She didn't use gender neutral pronouns. But I know why she didn't because if this book used they them for everything it would be unreadable. In my writing group, I've read a few stories with gender-neutral pronouns, and it just is really clunky, and I know it's our burden to kind of accept that clunkiness and just hope that the next generation it won't be as clunky. But in 1969, in a book that's already really heavy with words and phrases that you don't understand, it would be unreadable with they-them pronouns. So, don't, don't falter for that. I think this was really what got me into philosophical sci-fi, how a concept could be delivered in this fanciful, otherworldly, entertaining package, but still leave you with this feeling at the end, like you've really opened up a new doorway in your brain, or you've just seen the world from a different point of view so clearly that you are changed for good. That's like the ultimate achievement of a book, for it to leave you with a feeling like that. This book did that for me. I'm not sure if any one other book did. Perhaps Blind Sight, and we're getting to that, the reason why it's not on the list. It's such a rare feeling, and it's such an incredible feeling. It's like winning reading. I know that doesn't sound good, but it's like the pinnacle. It's the very top. It's why it's number one, and that's why it's my favorite book of all time. Let's get to some honorable mentions. Blind Sight's not on this list only because I don't have a physical copy of it. I borrowed it from the library, and I haven't found a used copy since. It would have messed with the logistics of it, with the reveal thing. And shout out to my wife for helping me make those. It's always fun to doodle random patterns. It's the closest to meditation I ever really get. A blind side I've talked about before, great philosophical sci-fi, an incredible idea at the very end of it, one that's unique to that book, I think. I don't think I've read anything that really touched on that aspect before. Devastating in a way, but really eye-opening. Also, The Lathe of Heaven by Le Guin as well. I didn't want to double up on an author in the list, but that's a great book. It's a novella. It's much lighter than Left Hand of Darkness. It's about a guy in a semi-dystopia who tries to get prescription drugs to suppress his dreams because his dreams are having a negative effect on his life, and about a doctor who tries to take advantage of that. It's really well done. Uh, Clockwork Orange, which I read recently, much better than the movie if only because of the last scene that they include here, but not in the movie. I'll leave that to entice you by itself. And lastly, The Sky Road by Ken McLeod. It's another far future world where humans had built up the technology needed to destroy ourselves, and then built up again to the point of space travel. The main character is working on the spaceship, but the issue is that there's so much trash in the orbit we don't have the technology needed to navigate our way through it. 
and the computers of the time have to be operated by these kind of mystic class of people. It's an interesting book. It's pretty clunky. I don't think it earns the page count. Ken McLeod definitely has a knack for setting the scene all in one sentence, which I really appreciated. It should be high on the actual list, but it just kind of highlighted just how subjective these kind of lists are. Just a little bit too much. Because objectively, it's not a great book. But it's the book I read when I made the rash decision to fly down to New Orleans and surprise my wife and propose to her. I don't usually make rash decisions, so it was pretty big for me. I decided it all at once. I was at work. I knew I needed to do it. Luckily, my boss was supportive. I flew down the next day, pulled this book out of my TBR, more or less at random. The plane ride down, there was actually a couple breaking up next to me. Who breaks up on an airplane? Uh, but luckily, symbolism doesn't exist in the real world, right? Just literarily? But then when I got there, I was calling her friends trying to covertly figure out where they were and catch up with them. And there was all these women on the street just wailing and sobbing and like running away from the parade route. Because it was New Orleans during Mardi Gras, not Mardi Gras day a few days before, but there's always parades rolling. And one of the floats had run over somebody and killed them. So the city was kind of in mourning, which was this weird mourning period in the middle of the biggest celebration. I ended up not proposing on that day. I proposed the next day and it went smoothly, obviously still going smoothly. And it's one of the reasons I like to have all the books that I read because when you're looking at your bookshelf, every spine tells a little story about your life. I read this book when I was visiting my mom. I read this book on vacation. I read this book at that shitty job. I read this book when my son was being born, you know? I really like that, being able to look at your life in these little vignettes and every spine inspires a memory. I don't know, it's nice. And that's what I got for you today. So, thanks for watching, subscribe if you haven't, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.